Welcome back, everyone. So uh, I'm Paulo Shakarian, and here on the Neurosymbolic Channel today, we have a special guest, Taylor Johnson. He is an associate professor of computer science at Vanderbilt University. Uh, lately, he's been focused a lot on neural network verification. He's been a performer on some major verification and neurosymbolic related programs, such as DARPA's Assured Autonomy and DARPA Answer. Welcome to the channel, Taylor. Uh, hi, Paulo. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. So maybe if we could start, um, you know, how did you getting into the area of verification? And then how did you start to apply these methods to neural networks? I mean, to me, it seems that this is really kind of one of the earlier um, attempts at neural symbolic AI. Uh, sure, yeah. So um, I guess there was some serendipity uh, as there, there always is in uh, how one directs research and gets interested in different things. Um, so originally I got into verification in grad school. So I did grad school at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign, with at the time a uh, new faculty member, uh, Cheyenne Mitra. And he does, uh, uh, at the time, what was going on was cyber physical systems were pretty new. There was kind of this confluence of computing and physical systems kind of at the intersection of control theory uh, and real-time systems and formal methods and verification. And we were looking at models of cyber physical systems and trying to then verify those. So that's sort of how we got started. Uh, this field is in part called hybrid systems, which uh, I guess for any listeners, uh, there's many different ways that term has been used. But in this case, the hybrid is the combination of discrete behaviors and continuous behaviors in their interaction. And um, originally, I had done some work in industry where I was doing some characterizations of power electronics and kind of there was software controlled converters to do things like voltage regulation, uh, like DC to DC to DC conversions. Um, and that's controlled by software. And as in this case, the kind of continuous or physical part would be uh, voltages and currents. And we were doing all kinds of characterizations, trying to make sure they would work uh, properly. Um, so we're using things like SPICE and all kinds of simulators. Uh, and if, if you're familiar with how things like SPICE would work, you may often do some variations of how the different RLC components, the resistors, inductors, and capacitors, because they're physical things uh, that we build, they typically, you get a data sheet and when you're building them, you get some tolerances and that ties in the manufacturing process and all, all kinds of things. Uh, but so these simulations we were doing they would provide some confidence, but I kind of was wondering like, well, how do we know it's gonna work for any RLC parameter value? Uh, and can we can we prove that? Um, and then working with Cheyenne in grad school, we worked some on that and then moved into some other areas too. But that was kind of the foundation. Uh, and we, we have developed in, in part a class of techniques called reachability analysis uh, in that context. And that was the start. And then as the machine learning and AI kind of revolution has been unfolding over the last, I don't know, decade, 15 years maybe, um, we started seeing more and more of these and we started thinking about them in similar contexts. So if you have a neural network, how are we gonna know? It may work for any uh, you know, possible input in that case, uh, which is maybe very hard. Um, but it turned out similar types of techniques could be applied in that context. And that's kind of how we got started. So it was kind of from hybrid systems into uh, this neural network and, and machine learning verification. And then even more recently, you know, due to some of the limits of 
uh, deep learning approaches, thinking about symbolic things as well, uh, kind of in the design of the systems. So you mentioned a, a bit in there about characterization of systems. Maybe if we could take a moment and you could kind of walk our viewers through the basic concept of verifying a specification with respect to a system, and then maybe touch on um, what challenges arise when that system is a neural network, and then how, you know, adding, you know, the intuition with how adding symbolic components to that uh, can also help with the process. Yeah, so so broadly, um, you know, a lot of people aren't too familiar with with formal methods and verification. Uh, so yeah, I think this is a, a good good segue to you know say a little bit more about what that is. But really, it, it's a very broad problem and broad problem domain. Uh, and the problem that's often studied is uh, given a model of a system in some language. Uh, and a specification of something that system should do, try to prove that that system does satisfy that specification. And we do mean prove in a kind of worst case sense or a mathematical sense. So there's all kind of techniques from, from classical techniques. So just to make it very concrete, right? Suppose our system or the thing we want to verify, uh, let's maybe move away from circuits, but look at a, look at a, well, we could we could do digital logic circuits instead of analog circuits, but um, let, let's maybe think of a, a broader example like sorting a list. Okay, so that's our problem. Uh, and let's say you build a function that given a list of numbers should return those numbers in ascending order. And it should work for any list of numbers. So how do we know that that's going to work? Well, you can do pen and paper proofs. Uh, you could write that code and then think about it carefully. Uh, maybe try to write all that down. You could maybe use uh, something a, a little or maybe a lot uh, more rigorous, which would be try to formalize that in an interactive or automated theorem prover, which would be a software tool that would help you uh, check the, the, the steps of the reasoning that would be involved in that proof. Uh, that it actually works for any list. Um, or you could try to do automated techniques uh, to establish that. And the, the latter class, this would encompass things like model checking and software model checking in this example case. Uh, and these are kind of whole, whole research areas. But uh, one of the types of approaches in those automated methods and in model checking, which is kind of the type of techniques we work on typically, uh, would be doing things like reachability. Um, so for this example, this this uh, context maybe is not uh, not not totally the best one, but it, it'd sort of be like where in the program could we get and what are the, the possible sort of outcomes? So it's a little abstract for this example, um, but hopefully kind of kind of makes uh, a little bit of sense. No, that that helps. So in in applying these methods to neural networks, kind of where, you know, what are the challenges that arise? You know, why why is this such a, um, you know, kind of tough area of research, at least from what I have seen? Yeah, so, so similarly to this, uh, to this, you know, like list sorting example, if I want that to work for any list, um, one of the big problems in the neural network verification context, so let, let me just say what that problem is here. Um, so that problem would be given a neural network and a specification, does the neural network satisfy that specification? Um, so one of the problems is what are the inputs? So depending upon the underlying task that you're looking at, uh, this can be really hard. Um, and Thinking about it in this worst case way, people are doing, including us. Uh, but one of the one of the main issues here is sort of what should the machine learning model do? So what is the specification of what it should do? So just to be completely concrete, let's suppose we have uh, an MNIST classifier, right? So we have handwritten digits from zero through nine. 
our space of inputs are pictures of a certain size, and this is a very big space. Uh, you could write down obviously all those numbers, but you could write down all sorts of other things, right? Like letters and just scribbles and maybe little pictures, right? Anything you could fit in in a in the MNIST case, I think 28 by 28 size box. Uh, so your input space is very large. The other aspect of it that's important is that the data set that's to, that's used to create, say, a neural network to, to do classification for this. So to go from those pictures to this picture is a zero, this picture is a three, this picture is a five, whatever. Um, the way that they're created, they're dependent upon these data sets. And uh, there's all kind of issues in just trying to say what that machine learning model should do. So I'd like to be able to say something like, for any picture of a digit between zero and nine, the classifier returns the correct class. But one of the issues here is that input space is essentially infinite. And one of the insights coming from the hybrid system, hybrid system domain, going back to our circuit example for the RLC components, those parameters can vary anywhere, you know, let, let's say for a resistor, it could be uh, 20 ohms or whatever, or it could be 19 through 21 ohms with the tolerances. But that's really a, a large kind of set of possibilities. It's small in comparison to our image example here, where I'd have all kinds of other things beyond the digits in that kind of valid input space. Uh, but but it's, it's similar. So it's still an infinite set. And, and so some of the techniques that worked in the hybrid domain, we've been able to use over here um, with, with kind of similar conceptual. But there's still major issues uh, in just trying to say what should a given machine learning model do for a particular task. So that's kind of one of the big challenges is, is specification. So is it in like the writing of the specification itself or... Or the, um, or is it um, inability uh, to create a specification with respect to, you know, arbitrary continuous input? So both of these, and in addition to the way that the, let's say for MNIST, just to make it fairly concrete, um, for that type of a task for that computer vision task, I know kind of what I want it to do, but how I can actually describe that mathematically so that we can analyze it is, is quite difficult. Uh, and um, it has to do with all these factors, right? The kind of size of the space, uh, that type of characterization, like what you mentioned, but also that there is this data set as well that is kind of characterizing what correct means. Um, but I can't really characterize it as precisely as saying for any image, it's going to work. We know even for a well-trained MNIST classifier, you won't have 100% accuracy, right, on a typical test data set. There's also other issues in if that data set really does very well characterize the space of inputs that are allowed, uh, it's probably going to be large and it may also have errors itself, right? So the data set from which these things are trained, there's many, there's all kind of interesting work showing problems in, in uh, you know, mistakes in the data sets, things being mislabeled. Uh, and all, all sort all of those type of things. So, so I, there's many, many challenges, I would say. Not only like how do we specify it, but all of the pieces that go into this. Okay. So yeah, I think that's kind of interesting in how these intuitions from these uh, cyber physical systems because of you know the continuous aspect of uh, certain inputs and in those problems has provided you insight into uh, you know, applying verification techniques to deep learning. So, um, you know, maybe you could walk us through some of the results that you've had in, in these programs that you've worked on. 
So just to make things a little bit concrete, uh, and I'll just mention some of this, uh, especially some of the theoretical foundation was was done by uh, Wei Ming and then Tran, who I think his picture will show up on another slide in a minute. Um, they're both faculty now, Wei Ming at Augusta University in Georgia and, and Tran at um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So, uh, so this is how we initially looked at this and just to make this concrete, uh, and this is within the overall neural network verification community, there's many different approaches and a lot of lingo uh, and all sorts of things. Um, but essentially you, you can think of what most of the approaches are doing in this context. And then there's different underlying methodologies and solvers that people use. But essentially if we have a neural network that's representing are represented as a function from some real space, say R to the N, to some other space, R to the M. So N inputs, M outputs. In our MNIST example, this could be a vectorized version of the picture. And the outputs, uh, typically we think about this in the, in the uh, before the last categorization layer. So before like the softmax or argmax. So it'd be in like the 10 dimensional output. So 10 classes. So if we have a, a set of inputs um, in that input space, we, we define this object we call the output reachable set of the network under that set of inputs uh, as being all the possible outputs you could get to. So this is essentially the image or the range of the neural network under that set of inputs. And kind of abstractly what this would look like, we have some set of inputs in the input space, and then they're gonna get mapped through the network. That's gonna give us some set of outputs. And then the specification uh, would be some, let's say bad states we're not supposed to go to in the output space. So to make this a little more concrete in our MNIST example, our input set could be a particular test image. So let's say a picture of a three. And our, we may then perturb that picture in some way. So let's say under some, some kind of a norm, people often use the L-infinity norm. Uh, and we may say all the nearby images should get classified the same way. And that would be the type of problem we could look at. So you can characterize what what some people in the community call this local adversarial robustness about uh, that data point. And I can talk a little bit more about that. But that's essentially the kind of core thing we're doing mathematically is we need ways to uh, compute this image or this range of the neural network under a set of inputs. And so computationally, in our approaches, what we do, we represent these sets this is some real space, the internals at some real spaces of different dimensions. Uh, we represent these as some kind of a polytope uh, in that high dimensional space. In the, the inside, going back to the hybrid system work, this is very similar to some of the type of things we need to do in the hybrid system domain, uh, where we might be computing sets of reachable states of some ordinary differential equations from some set of initial states. Uh, and we we there often need to do this kind of propagation of, of polyhedra or polytopes uh, through high dimensional spaces. And in the neural net context though, we essentially need to transform these uh, polytopes through the different layers. So whatever the different layers are doing, uh, that's gonna transform these shapes in various ways. Uh, but then we compute these and we may get uh, sets of these polyhedra depending on the layer types and all, all sorts of details. And then we check if the image or the range of the neural network under a set of inputs intersects with something that's bad, right? So like, let's say the wrong class or the scores that would correspond to the wrong class in the MNIST example. So as you, um, when you talk about like kind of uh, distances between the points, is that only based on so are you basically saying there that kind of distance between samples in the um, in the input space should be sort of comparable to the distance between samples in the output space? 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, the I mean that's maybe a way to look at it. The way the way that I kind of think about it, um, and if uh, I mean I, I have an I have an MNIST example uh, here that that maybe kind of can help make it a little more concrete. And this is some of the the work Tran had done. Uh, but what what the perturbation so people often look at uh, a specification of correctness and it's not clear this makes sense yet right and this is going back to the specification challenge one of the issues so so let's say uh for, for this plot what's shown this uh let's say we had this image this picture of a zero as the input and then let's suppose we've perturbed that and I'm considering uh, from that zero, allow any pixel in that picture to vary plus or minus one color value, right? So one color value here in MNIST, it's 8-bit color. So it'd be like slightly, any pixel can be slightly brighter, or slightly darker. So that would define a set of nearby images to that particular image. And then what we can do uh, with this kind of framework and the setup, we would propagate that whole set of images through the network. And at the last layer, so prior to the softmax or the argmax in the network, and, and the way that these are working, you, you basically get like a score in the, in the final layer that's going to be in the size or the, the dimensionality and the number of classes you have. So in this case, it's, it's MNIST, so it's zero through nine. So the score, if we were just doing straight inference for this image would probably be the highest. And so it would classify that picture as a zero. And what we're doing here, all those nearby images under a norm and typically the L infinity norm. And what that would mean is that particular picture of a zero, any pixel can be say plus minus one color value. That would characterize, you know, very similar looking uh, pictures of the zero. And what that would show you is that any image in that set of images is still going to be classified uh, as a zero. And the way that this works is um, if this minimum value for that particular class, in this case, the correct class of zero, if the min value is greater than the max value of any other class, then it's robustly classified. So what that would tell you is it's not the case that you know this class, I don't know, eight or nine or whatever, I guess eight here, uh, that's kind of close, but it its max wouldn't exceed this min. And, and basically what this would let us see is that, okay, this any of those pictures, you can imagine, you know, if you sampled it finitely, so imagine like a discrete set of these, we're doing it with reals, but uh, uh, any of those images, the scores of the one that looked kind of closest to an eight would have still gotten classified as a zero. That's kind of maybe one way to look at it. Is that kind of... Yeah, that's really interesting. interesting. Okay, good. So then, you know, this would be for like one, uh, for one particular digit. I think I'll maybe stop sharing because I think there's a few other things maybe we talk about outside of the slides. Uh, but uh, you then do this across the data set. So for that particular image, let's say it was robustly classified is what we'd say in that case, right? All of those nearby images all got classified still as their correct class. So it was robustly classified. So, um, so it gives me some notion that for that particular data point, things were good. But then I have the data set, and that's how we typically characterize machine learning models, doing like accuracy evaluation on a test data set. So then I do that across the entire uh, test data set and see for what percentage of those images are things robustly classified. So this will give you a percentage me measure, like robustness measure, in addition to accuracy. And that's kind of... This is not as good as what we'd like to do in formal methods and verification, right? Like that it works for any picture of a of a, a of any of those digits, right? It's going to correctly classify it for any of them properly. But it's something better than just doing accuracy evaluation. 
and it does give you some confidence or some at least some quantitative way of looking at the robustness and maybe a characterization against things like adversarial perturbations. So as you as you talk about that, it makes me start to wonder as the model is maybe applied to something out of distribution. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if if this kind of methodology, like let's say you are robustly classifying stuff in your you know, uh, training and test set, and then it's being used on something that's out of distribution. Would a classifier that's more robust, would it do better with data that's of a little bit different distribution? Or is this method, um, you know, more designed for data that still keeps the same distribution, but doing a, a more robust job? <clears throat> Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. I mean, we've, I haven't done a whole lot myself or in, in my group on on OOD things. I mean, I'm aware a little bit and, and more broadly in, in projects like Assured Autonomy, other people were working on that. Uh, there's some work in the, the kind of robustness verification domain where people are looking at this, but I, I think it'd be a good thing to look at more. So you could, you know, you could think of this as your specification, right? So one of the problems that's arising is when people try to use machine learning models, you may just use it on any data, right? And not the not the data from a distribution that the model was intended to be working on, um, which I think is kind of partly what you're getting at. And uh, there I would sort of say the we've underspecified the assumptions of how we should use this thing, right? So how should we use that machine learning model? I could try to use an MNIST classifier, for example, to classify, let's say, the instead of just uh, the digit zero through nine, all of the alphanumeric characters in English, right? But now that all of those, the A through Z, those are gonna be out of distribution from what we intended to be used. And the overall use case is also sort of different, right? So maybe I need many more classes for that thing to work properly, right? So I'd need like 36 or something classes for the A through Z alphabet and then 10 for the digits or something, right? So, so these these type of, type of scenarios. So I, I think uh, this kind of gets back to like being able to specify what the machine learning model should do, right? And and somehow out of distribution stuff, there's an inherent assumption that this has been trained in a certain data set and is going to be used in a certain data set, but things may be, that's one, one case of sort of out of distribution, but there's obviously others, right? Like different handwriting in this type of case or typeset characters instead of handwritten characters and all all this all these type of uh all these type of scenarios. So I, I think it's interesting. I think uh specification there may may help. Yeah, I guess as you talked about that, I kind of thought a bit, you know, going to your example of going from say just numbers to classifying numbers or classifying letters, but you know, I was sort of wondering about, well, if you go from classifying numbers and then adding in letters or some other kind of character in there, would it still be able to pick out numbers with high precision because it's robustly classifying those items? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a good question. Uh, sounds like a good uh, research project to work on. <laughs> so well, if anyone out there is is uh, looking to start a, a paper or submit a grant proposal on that, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to me and Taylor. We're, we're happy to collaborate. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, shifting gears just a little bit, like when we were talking prior to starting the call, you were mentioning uh, looking at uh, some kind of new and exciting applications of neural network verification um, with with some results that I think are, are coming out um, uh, later this month. So uh, maybe did you care to go over some of that with us? Yeah, so we we have a, a paper uh, 
that was led by Preston Robinette, who's uh, one of the PhD students here at Vanderbilt in my group, um, on looking at uh, these type of problems in some security contexts. Um, so this is maybe the one we can focus on where uh, it's maybe the easiest one to talk about given how the, the, the conversation has gone so far and it ties into the adversarial perturbations. So the, the work Preston's been doing uh, was uh, also done in conjunction with other with a couple other people in my group, as well as uh, Kevin Leach, who's one of our, uh, who's another faculty member here at Vanderbilt and who does security work. So um, we've looked a fair amount in the CPS domain at some of these applications and in autonomy applications, uh, but now we're kind of looking in, in the broader context and security uh, applications of machine learning have been around for a while and, and are increasing. So uh, Preston's paper will appear at this uh, formalized uh, conference in a few weeks or a month, and it's co-located with, with uh, ICSI, one of the software engineering venues. Um, and we looked at how people have used uh, neural networks to do malware classification. So given uh, binaries, try to do classification into, is this particular binary malicious or is it not? And then there's further delineations beyond that kind of binary type classification of malicious or not uh, into uh, if it is malicious, from what family of malware uh, did it come? So that's... Uh, that's one of the upcoming things. And it's kind of a new new domain for our group, at least, right? You heard how we started in hybrid and now we're doing uh, security stuff. Um, so so we're, we're excited about it. Um, and uh, there's, you know, some obvious adversaries that can arise in this case, uh, where things like robustness to adversarial perturbations that we've started looking at in the neural net verification world, and a lot of the approaches are evaluated on things like MNIST or CIFAR or ImageNet. But in these contexts, uh, in some of those contexts, an adversary could make sense, but in this malware scenario, adversaries really make sense, right? Because they're uh, the adversaries want to, you know, fool the networks into not classifying these particular samples as being malicious, even when they are, right? So the threat model here kind of is uh, is fairly clear. Oh, that's pretty interesting. So, you know, so as we, we think about kind of all of these things, you know, so then you've seen this evolution where you've gone from, you know, uh, kind of dynamic systems to neural networks, and now these, these varying applications such as security. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know, uh, injection of symbolic ideas into the system, you know, with some of these more, what are emerging as the neuro symbolic approaches could somehow help with these tasks. So how, how would that sort of mesh with kind of this line of work and verification that you've been studying? Um, so, so some of the more of the symbolic techniques is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, you know, the verification methods themselves, you can view as symbolic in, in a sense. And I think that's that's kind of one angle to look at this from. Uh, and another angle is whether the, the AI components or the AI systems are neurosymbolic themselves. Um, and so we've done more work on applying these kind of symbolic methods to the neural systems. So like in neural network verification, uh, but we've done some work in the thinking about if we did have combined neural and symbolic methods that are operating together to do something, how are we gonna verify those systems? Um, and we we have uh, have some work on that. The the approaches in that it's not in the the malware type of stuff. For that, it's pretty much for the malware things. Just to give the high level, uh, that's essentially what a lot of people do. They actually convert the binary into a picture. So they call it bit plots or byte mm -hmm. plots. 
you're going to, and then you just essentially train CNNs uh, to do this. And then the setup's almost exactly like MNIST. There's all kind of technical challenges, which is probably what Preston's uh, new paper is about. Um, because the features are a bit different. Some of them are discrete or categorical instead of just being uh, like pixel color values. So some of that changes. Uh, but in, in the analysis of models that are neurosymbolic themselves, we, we have some unpublished work uh, that, that we've been working on where we might have something like a state machine where in different modes of the state machine, different neural networks are used. So we kind of have a model of computation that's incorporating uh, neural aspects as well as symbolic aspects in the model. So it's not just a plain neural network now, which is what a lot of the work has been on, but it's kind of a new model of computation. So in this, you have, so are you saying that you have sort of multiple neural models that the uh, symbolic structures are sort of dictating which one is is relevant for the situation or something like that? Yeah, so that, that could be the type of use case. Uh, so, you know, in different modes, you're using different neural networks. Um, you know, maybe maybe to give a, we haven't done something like this, but it, the conversations give me an interesting idea, you know, for your out of distribution example, right? Maybe I, I have an MNIST classifier, so digit zero through one, and I have a uh, alphabet or an English character classifier. And as my first step, I decide which of these two to use. And if it's a digit, I use the MNIST classifier. If it's a letter, I use this other classifier. So something like that is kind of the, the, the type of use case we're thinking of. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and yeah, we're doing a little bit of work that is kind of, I think, touching on that as well, where we're learning rules that that dictates um, which version of a model to use, and it will give you, you know, the best accuracy. So that's really interesting. So um, as we as we wrap up here, um, you know, kind of what are your thoughts on the future of the field, especially you know, for let's say new graduate students that are looking to get into things like neurosymbolic AI or verification of neural nets, which are, you know, kind of hot topics these days. Um, yeah, for, you know, for people looking to get in the field, uh, I think there's many problems um, that need to be addressed. Uh, I think we're I I think the way I'll answer this, there's a bunch of ways I can answer this. Uh, but you know, if we go to the to the October executive order from uh, President Biden on the development of safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, there's many issues, uh, and and you know, verification and formal verification of these, and development of of neurosymbolic models. Uh, there's tons of problems. And, and probably not one single thing is going to address all of them, but there are many ways to make impacts. Um, and there, there are many issues, so many issues that uh, the community is looking at, but probably many issues we haven't thought of yet. Um, so I think it's it's very impactful in that sense. Uh, you know, if the, the president is saying to do this and you can look more broadly in, in the international <laughs> Uh, in the international space with some of the criteria and like the EU AI Act. Uh, these are important problems. Uh, the reliability of these things, if they're being used in critical scenarios, or even in scenarios where people think maybe they're not critical, but it may be affecting you uh, or other people, right? So there's all kind of great work on issues of bias in, in say, uh, Facial recognition systems, um, uh, projects like Gender Shades, for example, uh, and uh, you know that's a whole nother like side of things, right? And there's there's other approaches that may help to uh, mitigate some of these. But I, I think it's an exciting time because you can see the influence of of AI all over the place for for good uh, or not. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's TBD, I think, in 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 some cases. But so I think it's exciting in that sense uh, that there's 
uh, a lot of high level interests. There's a lot of, um, but I think, you know, the reason there's a lot of high level interests is because there are real issues uh, in the deployment of these. So it's exciting, but uh, you know, my view is we need more verification, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, I, I would agree, actually. So, well, thank you very much, Taylor. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and talk to our, our broader community that we've been building here. And uh, to all our viewers, uh, more information on Taylor and his research, as well as links to some of the papers can be found in the description. Uh, thank you again, and please feel free to like and subscribe. Bye now.